Good evening, and welcome to the April webinar presented by the National Keratoconus Foundation, which is a program of the University of California, Irvine. My name is Jason Marsak, and I will serve as your moderator this evening. Tonight's topic is entitled, So You Think You Need Corneal Crosslinking, and will be presented by Drs. Biran Megpara and Dr. Clark Chang. Also with us tonight, Taylor Young from the National Keratoconus Foundation will be curating questions from the audience. So during tonight's program, if you have a question based on what you hear, you can type it in the chat box on the right part of your screen. We will have some time during and at the end of the presentation to answer a few audience questions. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Biran Megpara is the co-director of refractive surgery and a member of the cornea service at Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has a busy clinical practice with a particular interest in keratoconus. He and his partners have been cross-linking patients since the FDA trials and have treated hundreds of patients to this date. Dr. Clark Chang is Director of Specialty Contact Lenses in the Cornea Service at Wills Eye Hospital and the host of a popular podcast show, Chang Reaction. With over a decade of research experience in corneal cross-linking and other advanced corneal treatments, Dr. Chang publishes and lectures extensively in management of keratoconus, innovative specialty contact lens technologies, and modern refractive surgeries. He was also named this year's top doc by the National Keratoconus Foundation. Dr. Megpara and Chang. Great, thank you, Jason, for your introduction. I wanna thank everybody for joining uh, myself and Dr. McPara in this, you know, obviously very challenging time. And I uh, just wanna say uh, ahead of time that uh, we were supposed to, we were originally planning to be in the same room, uh, you know, while presenting so that we could kind of give you a little bit more of the, of the cuff and life interactions uh, while in the same room, but obviously now we're respecting social distancing. So there you may hear, you know, uh, us giving each other directions throughout the uh, lecture of uh, advancing slides. And uh, so do do apologize for that ahead of time, but uh, we want to keep everybody healthy as well as uh, ourselves. And today I'm very happy to have Dr. McPara with me because uh, we work very closely in the cornea service at Wells Eye and uh, in terms of co-managing patients who may need, you know, who needs cross-linking, maybe other surgeries, which, you know, we're going to touch up on a little bit later. And then when is the best point for contact lens to improve the best, to uh, improve to the best level vision that a patient can obtain. Um, so we find this type of, um, you know, this type of team care between the two of us, and obviously a lot of our doctors and staff in our department, uh, gives the best uh, experience for our patient and the best outcome. And we, I want to give everybody enough time to go into our Q&A, so I'm going to go into the next slide and have Dr. McPara start the uh, presentation for us right away. Dr. McPara? Thanks, Clark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Jason and, and everyone for inviting us. So I'd like to start with just giving a little bit of background on keratoconus and what the disease um, is. And, and this is a very similar conversation that I have with patients and their families when they come see me in the office. So first off, keratoconus, it's, it's a condition of the cornea, which is the very front part of the eye. And normally that cornea is supposed to have a nice round shape. And what happens is in keratoconus is that cornea starts to become distorted and protrudes out. And, and this photo uh, does a nice job of showing that. It's kind of a side view photo. And you can see that the, the cornea, um, instead of having a nice round shape, it almost looks a little pointy, almost like a cone. And that's the appearance patients get over time as their keratoconus worsens. This is just another view of the patient looking down. And again, you can see that there's some distortion there. And the cornea, it just doesn't look round like it should. Now, in addition to protrusion of the cornea, the cornea also thins. So this is a cross-sectional view of the cornea. We call it a slit beam view. And you can see a beam of light going through the middle of that photograph. And if you look at the top of the photograph and at the bottom of the photograph, and look at the thickness of the beam, and then compare that to the thickness of the beam right in the middle. And typically, that's what we see. We see that the central or, or just off the center of the cornea starts to protrude and it starts to thin out. And, and this is, in essence, what keratoconus is. Now, the condition itself is not super common, but it, it is quite prevalent. So we 
estimate that the prevalence of the disease is about 50 per 100,000 people. So to put that in a little bit of context, if you take a city like the size of the Philadelphia, which is where Dr. Chang and I are from, you can estimate that there's about seven to 800 cases of keratoconus. Now we don't know exactly what causes this. Um, and, and patients often ask that, but what we do know, it's not something that you caught or it's not something that you did. So it's not your fault. And patients that are often worried, you know, did I do something to get this? Is it my fault? Did somebody give it to me? And that's definitely not true. We do know of certain associations and risk factors for the condition. And Dr. Chang will go over that in just a minute. Absolutely. As far as may I ask you a quick question? In terms of the um, in terms of the prevalence rate that you just quoted, a lot of our patients, including those who are you know experts on the phone with us right now, um, they've looked online. They know that number that you had just spoken about. But lately, there's been some epidemiology studies from different parts of the world stating that the numbers may be higher. Um, what's your opinion on that? Is keratoconus really as rare as people used to think? No, I don't think it's rare. And and you know another thing is, you know. There are, I'm sure, patients around that are walking around undiagnosed, perhaps with very, very mild disease that, that they may not even know that they have that we don't pick up on until later in life. So I, I would agree with you, Clark, that you know, perhaps there are more people out there with keratoconus than we think. Okay. Um, going back to, to kind of the natural course, this is essentially something that you, know, you, were, you were almost born with. Um, it's something that I was pre-programmed or you're predestined to get. And it doesn't start to affect your cornea right away though. Typically we start to see changes in, in our patient's cornea in early adolescence, so maybe early to, to mid-teens. And then the condition typically progresses or, or, or gets worse into one's mid-20s or 30s. And then at some point in everybody's life, the condition just stops. Um, now, these are just general guidelines. There are, of course, variations to this. Sometimes keratoconus can start earlier in life. I've had patients, um, the youngest patient I've seen is six years old. Um, and then sometimes the condition can progress later on. Um, so we've seen patients progress into their late 30s, 40s. I've had one patient in their early 50s still progress. As far as, you know, does it affect one eye or both eyes? Almost always keratoconus affects both eyes, but patients will often tell us that, you know, and, and will notice this, that one eye sees significantly worse than the other. So the disease can often be quite asymmetric, but typically it does affect both eyes. And um, as Dr. Mepara had pointed out, um, you've seen the, you know, the photos that in the previous slides of the shape change of the eye. And that explains why a lot of times the optical management in terms of, you know, how to best utilize your vision, whether it's with glasses or contact lenses, that dictates what kind of utilization we need to, or strategy we need to utilize. And the reason being, if you have a very smooth shape eye, and I usually tell patients, imagine looking at a, you know, we've all sort of played around with magnifiers and focus lights when we're little and doing scientific environment, uh, experiment in like, you know, uh, burning, uh, causing fire to leaves and that type of thing. And so imagine that magnifier is a very of a very smooth contour, right? And the higher the power, the shape changes because um, your shape is very intimately related to the power that's required by the system. And so if the, if the shape is really smooth, that say looks like a bell curve, peaks in the middle, kind of drops off on both sides very evenly, um, that typically is what a cornea looks like without astigmatism, then your glasses at that point can still help you. Now, normally that's when it's very early stage keratoconus to maybe even pre-keratoconus. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, a family example that um, beer and has for us later. As the shape changes though, as you see that shape gets bulgier, bulgier, or we call it, you know, clinically as steeper or steeper. Um, the, the, as the contour becomes steeper, it loses that, sim, is that symmetry. So there's an area that bulges forward, but it's typically not in the middle. So you're, if you look at a cross section of a cornea, it doesn't have that bell curve shape anymore. And therefore, if you don't fix the shape, just supply a prescription through the glasses, 
it doesn't really help you. And that's the reason why as the keratoconus patient goes into um, different stages of the disease, they now we call them irregular cornea because the contour is not a predictable sloping anymore. And not only then, therefore, a contact lens that can maintain the shape that's customized, uh, whether the power or the shape of the lens that's customized for that cornea is the only way to them to eliminate the asymmetry factor in the shape and improve vision. But, you know, as the disease, if it's unmanaged, as it continues to go forward, we know that a lot of keratoconus patients, even without wearing contact lenses, they have scarring of the eye. As you can see in this photo, that, you know, whitish area that sort of look like honeycomb or lattice type of structure. In this case, it's corneal scarring, and that's going to block out some light that can penetrate through contact lens and then through the cornea. And therefore, if you have very dense scar, in the uh, sen in the area where you're focusing, we call that visual axis, then no matter how good a contact lens is, it's not going to improve your vision. And that's why it's very important uh, now that we have a stabilization, a stabilization approach with keratoconus. And also in later stages, um, keratoconus really affects all layers of cornea. Some people think that it affects specific layers early on, but really affects all layers so that the back layer of the, of the cornea can um, have stress lines and rip open. And what happens, the fluid of the eye can enter uh, into the cornea, causing, as you can see, massive area of whitening uh, because of edema and separation of tissue. We call this type of episode hydrops, and it doesn't always, it typically is painless, but it certainly can, depending on the amount of inflammation it causes, it certainly can be accompanied with pain. And when you have that, even if you see really well with your contact lenses prior to this hydrops episode, you will have to stop wearing your contact lenses. So there's definitely a lot of health disadvantages and at, at the very least inconveniences when you uh, leave keratoconus uncontrolled and just allow it to continue to get worse because you don't know when this type of high drop episode is going to occur. And so what we think in the uh, association of keratoconus, as you have heard a lot of diseases that can, uh, that are comorbidities um, that concurrently occur with uh, keratoconus, uh, both of us would tell you that we think the largest risk factor likely is eye rubbing, right? We And we're gonna show you something a little bit later that may surprise you in terms of why eye rubbing is not good for your cornea. But it is really unknown how much, how hard you have to rub your eye to destabilize your, the condition of keratoconus. Therefore, it's a very important factor to control either before or after a certain surgical um, management such as cross-linking even. And this also has some implication to how you should fit a contact lens. I can't tell you the number of times I have patients come to me um, and say, you know, can you fit me a contact lens that helps me to stop the progression of my keratoconus? And the answer is no, I can't. We used to think that maybe using a lens that push, that leaves some amount of compression force on the eye can be good for keratoconus because it almost act like a retainer that you wear for, uh, you know, for your teeth. Um, but, you know, more and more we're thinking any amount of trauma is likely not healthy for keratoconus cornea. And that has certainly changed my contact lens fitting philosophy in terms of how gentle I want to be with the contact lens while it sits on your eyes. And you can also see other associations, of course, um, uh, with the uh, of diseases with keratoconus. So one of the most common questions, <clears throat> Clark, that I get in the office from either patients or family members is, is keratoconus genetic? You know, they're worried that, you know, their children or their siblings may have this condition. And even though we don't, at least as of now, know of a specific hereditary pattern, we do know that there is a positive family history in, in six to eight percent of cases. And the other thing that we know is let's say you have keratoconus. Um, a first degree member of your family is more likely to have um, basically borderline keratoconus, or the technical term for that is form first keratoconus. So we have this picture here, um, and this is actually a picture of myself um, in the middle, um, and my wife and her brother, and my brother-in-law. So those of you who are looking at this may be asking, why is he showing me a family photo in the middle of this keratoconus talk? Interesting enough, my brother-in-law has keratoconus, and my wife has this borderline 
irregular cornea or, or form first keratoconus. So Clark was alluding to this earlier, but this is uh, what we call a topography. It's basically a map of our cornea. It's a measurement that we take in an office. Um, it's basically a scan of the cornea. And we're basically measuring the shape. And this is a picture of my cornea. And I have a little bit of astigmatism. But when we're looking at this, what we're looking at is we're looking for symmetry. So, you know, you don't have to be an eye doctor to, to fully analyze this, but if you look at the top of the picture and you look at the bottom of the picture, they're almost like mirror images. So this is what we call regular with the rule astigmatism. This is not a disease. This is something that can be easily corrected in glasses or contacts. Now contrast that with my brother-in-law's topography. He's the one that has full-blown keratoconus. And you can very easily tell that the bottom of that image looks very, very different than the top of that image. There's that big red circle, and that is the area of protrusion or distortion that keratoconus patients have. And then my wife's topography is kind of a it's kind of a mix of the two of ours. Um, so there is some resemblance of, of that hourglass there but it's not symmetric. So we call that inferior steepening. So the bottom part has more red or more warm colors than the top part. So again, she's got that borderline keratoconus that we often see in first degree family members. So yeah, that's a nice little personal um, um, story that, that you know, we have there. So then uh, Biren, what do you tell patients who come to you? Uh, two things, right? Number one, how do you suggest uh, their on their family members on ongoing, ongoing eye care to be? And number two, um, what do you tell them about the chances of, say, their offspring may get keratoconus when they ask you? Um, as far as that first question, I recommend that all first degree family members get regular eye exams, annual eye exams, um, because as I'll talk about in just a second, we want to make sure we make the diagnosis of keratoconus as early as possible. As far as trying to give patients the likelihood that their children could potentially have keratoconus, that's a really tough question to answer. Um, and, and I tell them, by no means is it an absolute certainty. And actually, they're more likely to not have it than to have it. But I, I honestly don't have a true number. I can't tell them that you know 5% of the time or 10% of the time it happens. But we do know that there's a family history of mild abnormalities of the cornea in six to eight percent of patients. The other important thing, and the reason we picked up my wife's abnormal cornea, is um, she actually came to see me uh, to see if she would be a good candidate for LASIK. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a, a, an entirely separate talk, but anyone with signs of keratoconus is a very bad LASIK candidate. So one of the things that I ask all my LASIK patients um, in the screening process is, do you have a family history or do you have a family member that has keratoconus? Uh, because that may make them, even though they may not have it, that may make them a less than ideal candidate for, for, for laser vision correction like LASIK. Um, so kind of the way I approach my keratoconus patients, what is my gold standard at least, is I want to make the diagnosis of keratoconus as early as possible. So that just reiterates the importance of getting regular eye exams just to check on the health of your eyes as early as possible. And then Clark, as you were alluding to, I make sure I counsel every single patient that they should not be rubbing their eyes. We wanna make sure that they eliminate anything that they could be doing to themselves that could, that could potentially make keratoconus worse. And, and two things that I find helpful, controlling seasonal allergies with either topical allergy drops that we can um, give a prescription for, or there are some over-the-counter ones, as well as oral systemic allergy medication. Cold preservative-free artificial tears also, in our experience, helps patients with that itching or that kind of urge to rub the eye. And then probably the most important thing now is cross-linking. Um, and, and this has really changed the way we manage our keratoconus patients. And again, that is why it's super important to make the diagnosis as early as possible.
Yeah, um, and that's a great lead up to getting into a little bit more detail about what exactly what's cross-linking. A lot of people, and maybe not so much, oh, and hopefully not, um, you know, recently after FDA approval, but I will tell you that when we first started, um, you know, with when I was first involved with the clinical trials in U.S. prior to FDA approval, a lot of patients come in to, uh, you know, wanting to be enrolled in clinical trials, and part of them do wonder whether or not this is such a new, um, treatment option and 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 that always leads to the discussion of if it's if it's new is it risky so you know i want i want to sort of give you an anecdote about how the um germ the um dresden university investigators from germany how um they came about with regard to the idea of applying cross-linking to the cornea many of you may have heard Linking Teal Styler went to a dentist's office and was wondering, had a feeling done, and was wondering what this blue light is doing uh, at the end of the procedures. The answer is it obviously changes the biomechanical property of the filling material, and so it hardens the dental filling. So then that's the when he thought, oh, I wonder if I could somehow find a way to deliver that energy from UV light and cause uh, reactions within uh, a clear avascular tissue like a cornea. So, and if you look further back, even if you look further back, if you look at pathology dissection sampling, where we, you know, put things in a reagent like formaldehyde to stiffen the material so you could slice them into sample sizes, or even in heart valve transplantation, if you're like me who uh, is in insomnia and like to stay up and look at uh, infomercials, you'll see that you have these little UV light that you can purchase and. You you could, and it comes with a specific type of uh, a glue material that you could actually use for a lot of small uh, household um, furniture object repair. Um, I've had a lot of friends who, after hearing me say that, they go out and they buy this um, sort of how you could do a cross-linking to um, to uh, on your own, obviously not on yourself, but uh, it's a DIY cross-linking if you would, including the very last. Um, if you see that photo at your uh, if your left bottom hand side, you'll see that um, that's me actually, I mean, that's what I do with uh, uh, patients who need very customized character uh, customized content lenses. I do an impression lens and the material will take on the shape of the eye and the configuration for a certain period of time. And then that, then the shape is scanned into making a content lens, it's called an eye print. So that's actually also a cross-linking process. So a lot, there's a lot of cross-linking um, inspired, if you would, process happening all, all around us that we are not even aware of. So really it's not a new concept. And I'll show you when we go to the next slide that sort of, and same thing, like I said, uh, University of Dresden in Germany, they first started uh, looking at this concept, initially published their finding, their pilot study in 2003, and that um, in that uh, incurred a lot of uh, international echoes with the investigator, investigators in Europe and Asia and different parts of the world, and finally got to our U.S. approval in 2016. Um, so, which now be, is uh, def, arguably the standard of care for keratoconus worldwide and really can't diminish the importance of uh, as, you know, early treatment and early diagnosis as early as possible. And so the treatment goal, a lot of people think, oh, you know, and this happens with a lot of different treatments with different conditions every time that patients receive um, a treatment and undoubtedly you always think, oh, that's going to somehow reverse the course of my disease. So we need to be very clear about what cross-linking does. Uh, the reason we want to catch it as, and diagnose it as early as possible and discuss treatment option or potential cross-linking in this case as early as possible is because the main goal of stable, uh, the main goal of this treatment, at least as of now, the, the iteration that we have right now that's FDA approved, it's really meant for stabilization so that the disease doesn't get any worse and the eye doesn't protrude or gets deeper, like I said, in the, on topography. And therefore, hopefully we could preserve as much vision as we can prior to further loss of vision that now with cross, you know, with cross linking can be considered as unnecessary loss of vision. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And what's that? It's a bonus. So again, the 
Why? And so because it doesn't, the main goal is stabilization, doesn't completely reverse the course of the disease. And therefore, if you're already relying on a contact lens to, um, you know, to correct the shape factor, as I talked about earlier, of the keratoconus cornea and vision. Therefore, even after uh, cross-linking, if you already need that prior to cross-linking, it's not going to eliminate or reduce the need for either glasses or contact lenses. You're going to have to, a keratoconus patient would have to be caught very early and would have no inherent prescription need inside of the eye for that patient to not need glasses or contact lenses. So majority of the patients will need glasses or contact lenses after cross-linking, I do want to stress that. Um, so the, uh, like I said, a lot of overwhelming amount of data led to um, the init initiation of the FDA study trials. And uh, after it was indicated, now remember that we're obviously, we have to prove and re you know, we have to confirm the study data found oversee by using uh, our own data, treating our own population within our country because you don't know if there's going to be geographic differences um, of uh, population responses. And that's why we still had to go, when we, um, when we first started the clinical trials, we still have to mimic the study design uh, of what other people did and what University of Dresden did uh, in you know, basically in late, late 1990s, early 2000s. That is, they were first treating uh, keratoconus patients who were progressing to show that cross-linking works to stabilize progression. And that's the only reason why the study data in uh, submitted into FDA only enrolled patients with progression. And that's the only, that's again the reason why downstream led to the indication or the approval for patients with progression. And also the study looked at people between 14 and 65 years old. And so anything be younger than that or older than that will be considered off-label, but it is possible. Like has said earlier, there are patients that we have seen that uh, progress a lot earlier, a lot younger than 14, and certainly older than what we typically think about, you know, mid-30s stabilizing. We have seen a lot of patients as well who progresses into their 40s, even early 50s. And because there's some um, uh, there are some studies that looked at the amount of dissipation of UV energy going through uh, a cornea while the cross while cross linking is occurring with riboflavin, and we'll talk a little bit about that later if you haven't heard that term. And they calculated 400 micron as the unit of thickness of the eye for it to be really safe, and so that the energy getting in the remnant energy transmitted inside of the eye is safe for other eye structure, and that's our preference as well. Again. And it's not the it's not absolutely mandatory, but that is our preference. If we could catch people early enough that they haven't gotten so thin, so the unit of the cornea is 400 micron or more. Yeah, Clark, I just wanted to stress that you know even though the FDA indication is 14 and over, we do treat patients younger than that. In fact, the youngest patient that I have crosslinked thus far is a nine-year-old boy who was an absolute champ. He did really well during the procedure and even our younger patients they definitely benefit from from the procedure and and they do a great job of tolerating it tolerating it at least in my experience yeah i agree and uh, so just a little um a little bit of uh, uh sharing of the fda data um in the design and those of you may some of you may actually went through uh that enrollment so it, we separated patients into different groups and um and, and also treated only one at a time so you have people who were select randomized for treatment and people who um were uh, their study eye was randomized to uh, what we call a sham control which is they didn't get treatment initially and so the difference if you track them over time is that you see the cornea becoming uh, not as protruded uh, on average for in the treated population that's in the blue bar. So you could see that um, the bar goes downwards because it's going towards a better direction in terms of that shape factor of the eye. And those who are not cross-linked in the gray bar goes upward because their cornea is protruding a little bit more after one year. And so that means also their vision gets a little harder to control or improve using glasses as they get worse. And so the difference can, is actually quite startling when you look at the difference um, between the, the worsening and then the, the improvement in the shape of the eye under the cross-link group. So uh, very that's what led to the eventual uh, FDA approval in 2016. 
So we, we've mentioned this a few times, but you know, cross-linking is indicated for keratoconus that's progressing. So as a specialist in keratoconus, one of the most important things that I have to do is to try to figure out if my patients are progressing or not. And this is a very wordy, wordy slide. And this was taken from um, kind of a, a global meeting of keratoconus experts from around the world in 2015, where they tried to come up with a good definition of progression. And what they really came up with is there isn't a great definition for it. So even right now, we don't have a clear definition, but we do have a lot of ways that we potentially try to detect it. And these are some of the things that I look at in every single patient that comes in and sees me. But basically what it comes down to is I'm looking for signs of a decrease in vision, a change in prescription, and, and most importantly, a change in the variety of tests that I do to see if a patient's progressing or not. And we don't have a single test, a blood test or a scan that I can do on a patient and it says yes or no that they're progressing. What we're really looking for is change over time. So that involves seeing patients you know, at least twice, if not three or four times, and looking for a pattern that's telling me that you know, the testing is getting worse, and because the testing is getting worse, that's the reason we need to we need to do the cross-linking. And this is just a slide. This is kind of a newer tool that I use. It's called the Pentacam. And it takes various measurements in the cornea. It looks at the front of the cornea, the back of the cornea, the thickness of the cornea. And it plots that on a nice graph for me. And I like to show this to my patients, actually, in the room to, to show them that, look, your keratoconus is getting worse. So as the, the lines on the bar graph, the higher the line, the worse the cornea is. So you can see in a couple of columns there that those bars are going higher and higher, and that's telling me that the keratoconus is getting worse, it's continuing to progress, and this patient definitely needs to have cross-linking. So before we, we jump into the nitty gritty of cross-linking, I'd like to pause and, and see if there's any questions. Jason? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um... This is actually um, a topic I think that the, the listeners are obviously very interested in. Let me try and get as many by you as we can in a few minutes here. Sure. Um, so a couple of talks, maybe just in general terms, we have uh, two questions related to cost of the procedure. Any any like commonality in terms of cost of the procedure and anything regarding the coverage of insurance for the procedure? We're actually, maybe if we could table that for just a few slides, we have a few slides and we're going to dedicate a few minutes to talking exactly about that. Um, Sounds great. But, but, yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe we'll just go into that a little bit later. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a couple more. We have, um, um, if, it, if an individual uh, has developed cataracts and is considering that surgery, um, any, any consideration of cross-linking and cataract surgery? That's a great question, and um, I get asked that quite a bit. Now, in general, I do not recommend cross-linking in preparation for cataract surgery. I feel, and most of us feel, that cross-linking is a treatment for progression, and by the time patients get to the point in life where they need cataract surgery, which is usually you know, their 60s or 70s or later, that cornea has already stopped progressing. The actual act of having cataract surgery shouldn't make the keratoconus any worse. So in general, um, we are not cross-linking prior to cataract surgery or in preparation for cataract surgery. All right. Um, and we also have a, this one kind of tags on directly with that. Um, probably a quick answer to this. Is cross-linking a good idea if over 70 years of age? Generally, over 70, no. Um, yeah. There's usually, what happens to your cornea over time as you get older is it actually naturally cross-links itself. So it actually stiffens on its own, and that's why the keratoconus doesn't progress. So 70 is probably a little later than I would recommend. In general, most of our cross-linking patients are in their teens or 20s. That being said, sometimes it can progress into 
one's 40s and I have cross-linked um, a handful of patients in their 40s, that's usually the upper limit though, as far as keratoconus goes. Sure. All right, and maybe just one or two more here real quick. Um, how do you, do you consider cross-linking for individuals who have undergone a transplant? That is also a very good question. Um, sometimes after a corneal transplant, maybe years afterwards, you know, 15, 20 years, we can sometimes see that the keratoconus may quote unquote start to come back, meaning that new transplanted cornea starts to develop some irregularities or, or some protrusion. Um, Unfortunately, usually when that happens, it happens at what's called the graft host junction, which is in the periphery of the cornea, not in the middle part of the cornea. And that is something that often can't be treated with the cross-linking device. So if we're seeing a significant recurrence of the cone in a transplanted cornea, rather than doing cross-linking, what I'm usually recommending is doing a repeat corneal transplant for the added benefit also of probably getting better vision with the repeat transplant than the patient has already. All right, we'll do this last one for this session here. Um, you had talked a little bit earlier about, you know, a case where you had, you know, three individuals, someone who was um, typically cited an individual with um, keratoconus and someone maybe in the middle, we might consider that borderline. Mm -hmm. um, how do you consider maybe cross-linking the individual that you kind of classify as borderline? What's the decision-making process? What would you want people to know about, about that? I would want them to make sure that they get regular follow-up and regular testing. Um, ideally with one of these newer devices that can measure different types, different spots of the cornea. And if we see any signs that that is getting worse, right then and there, I would recommend cross-linking. Now the question is, you know, how frequently should these patients be followed? If I have a 10-year-old that has maybe a little funny looking cornea, I want that 10-year-old back in my office in four to six weeks for another set of scans. Because again, I want to catch it as young as I can. And then, you know, if that set looks normal, then I'll spread it out a little bit more to maybe two or three months and then gradually spread it out. Now, if I catch that borderline cornea in someone that's in their 30s, well, then I'm less worried. Um, because maybe if they have some very, very mild keratoconus, statistically, they've already stopped progressing, um, most likely. So, in that situation, I'd maybe have the patient come back in four to five months for the initial follow-up. Um, but, you know, I would, if they have progression, then I would call them keratoconus and I would go ahead and cross-link, even before the vision gets bad, because that's the key, right? You want to catch it before the vision starts to decline so that we're able to preserve and maintain that vision for the rest of the patient's life. Wonderful. Thank you for those answers. I think a lot of the next questions will probably be addressed in the next part of your talk so we can uh, proceed. Perfect. All right. So yeah, let's go ahead and, and talk about cross-linking itself. So what we're doing at Will's Eye Hospital is the FDA approved protocol. It's also known as the Dresden protocol from where it was invented. And this is what we call epithelium off cross-linking. So the epithelium is the outermost layer of the cornea. Think of it as the skin to the cornea. And in order for this procedure to work, what we have to do is remove the epithelium. Um, and what that involves is applying topical numbing medicine to the surface of the eye and either putting in a holder to keep the eye open or, or just me holding it open with my fingers and then using a blunt instrument and gently wiping away that top layer of the cornea. That takes about two to three minutes to do. It does not hurt at all. Um, the numbing medicine does a great job of preventing any pain during the actual procedure. You do feel a little bit of touch. It's a little bit of a weird feeling. You can kind of feel someone touching your eye, um, but, but it's not causing you any pain, but it's over very, very quickly. That's actually the only part of the procedure that involves me or an instrument 
actually coming in contact with the eye. The rest of it is really just applying drops in ultraviolet light. So the drops, um, we use what's called riboflavin, it's a B vitamin, and we apply those drops to the surface of the eye for 30 minutes. We do one drop every two minutes for a total of 30 minutes. And what that allows is for that riboflavin to penetrate through the cornea and soak into the deeper, into the deeper levels of the eye. Um, after about 30 minutes, we check the patient and make sure that that riboflavin has soaked far enough through and also to make sure that the cornea is of adequate thickness. And, and you know, Dr. Cheng mentioned this a little earlier, the cornea has to be 400 microns in thickness. And this is what uh, that photo is showing what's called a pachymeter where I'm measuring the thickness of the cornea. And the reason we use 400 microns is we think that is the minimum amount of cornea needed to prevent this ultraviolet light from damaging structures deeper in the cornea or deeper in the eye. So once we have an adequate cornea, we start the light treatment and we apply ultraviolet light to the cornea for 30 minutes. Now, this light has to be applied continuously. So we do put um, a holder in to keep the eye open. That's probably the most uncomfortable part of the entire procedure is just having something holding your eye open. Although within a couple minutes, patients get used to it really well. Throughout this, we are putting more riboflavin onto the surface of the eye. And also, if the patient starts to develop some discomfort, we're continuously giving numbing medicine just to make sure that our patients um, are tolerating the procedure well. So overall, it's about an hour and a half long procedure with the protocol that we're using. After the procedure is done, we place a bandaged soft contact lens on the surface of the eye. We start the patient on antibiotic drops as well uh, to prevent infection, as well as steroid eye drops to prevent scarring. And then we try to control the patient's pain as best as we can. Now, speaking of pain, remember the procedure itself does not hurt at all, but because we did remove the epithelium, we've essentially created a scratch on the cornea. The cornea is one of the most sensitive parts of the entire body. So if you've ever scratched your cornea, you know it's not the most pleasant thing, the most pleasant feeling in the world. So patients do have a moderate amount of pain for you know, two to four days. It's worse than the night of the procedure. The next day, it's a little bit better. The next day after that, it's a little bit better. And it gradually does get better. And it goes away with time. But I do prepare my patients. I don't try to sugarcoat it. You're going to have a moderate amount of pain afterwards. But it does go away fairly quickly. The drops help. Um, the contact lens helps. We can prescribe oral pain medication as well. Um, maybe something to take the ed edge off, but there's nothing I can give to completely eliminate it. But the good news is, as soon as that epithelial defect starts to heal, the pain starts to go away. And in about four to five days in a young, healthy individual, like most of our cross-linking patients are, that scratch has healed up. Um, afterwards, patients do have a little bit of corneal haze that does resolve over several months. And because of this haze, um, the vision does dip a little bit in the immediate post-op period. So again, the goal is to, to get our patients back to their baseline, back to where they started. But for the first month or so, sometimes two months, patients will notice that the vision is fuzzier than what they had before surgery. And that's completely normal. And that's just because the cornea initially has some irregularity to it, like what you see in this photograph. Um, and then it starts to have a little bit of haze. And again, that dissipates over several months. And the cornea eventually stabilizes after about three to six months after treatment. And again, stabilization is what we're looking for. Stabilization is considered success. And this procedure has a very high success rate, um, over 95%. And then speaking of haze, you know, if, if you know, a year after surgery or two years after surgery, you may be seeing another eye care professional and they comment that, oh, your cornea looks a little hazy. That is something that's completely normal. So, you know, if you can appreciate in this photo, it's not, you can see a little bit of whiteness or grayness to that photo right in the middle. That's this very mild post-operative haze that we see after cross-linking. It's generally not visually significant, but it's something that if 
someone looks at your cornea, they may notice, but it's nothing to worry about. And uh, so what about after cross-linking? What kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of people feel almost invincible, everything's stabilized, they go back to their glasses or content lenses, and uh, when this video plays, you see that, um, it, and if anybody, this is not a lie, you know, I don't hear your response, so I'm going to usually ask a question about anybody knowing what this bridge is. It's actually the uh, uh, Tacoma Bridge in Seattle that uh, collapsed due to a high wind. And what, uh, what are we trying to show you here? We're trying to tell you we don't exactly know how much energy you can, you need to add into a, a structure, even a structure that you think is very strong, in order to break it. And so therefore, after cross-linking, after your cornea is strengthened, it's, we're still going to recommend that you to not rub your eyes to control seasonal allergies that may be causing eye itching and sometimes contact lens wear at the end of the day, whether you have dry or not, dry patients even more so, may tend to kind of want to rub their eyes a little bit. And so my recommendation would be maybe try to evaluate whether or not a different contact lens may be more uh, comfortable for you if that was the reason for rubbing or to uh, you know instill those chill uh, artificial tears and just again to show an example of somebody who we thought actually it's a case from a friend of mine who uh, you would think that 42 year old you know somebody's very stable is wearing a um, scleral lens very happily seeing really well five months later came back as you can kind of appreciate there's a distance on the top photo between the cornea which is the whitest grayish structure and the clear structure um, on the top is your content lens and there's a space in between. That space disappeared after five months, showing you that people can still continue to get worse without cross-linking, even into their 40s or after. Uh, and next slide. All right, so Jason, and, this, this I think will address yeah. that, that one question. This is actually one of the, probably the most common question that I get is, is it covered by insurance? So I'll turn it over to Clark for that. Sure. And so this, as of uh, September last year, um, the the uh, there are about 62, and right now a total of 67 as of uh, as of this month of uh, commercial, re both national and commercial and regional commercial health insurance plans that are actually actively covering for cross-linking. So although it's not, it definitely isn't impossible to get coverage. Uh, doing the FDA approved uh, cross-linking makes, is the only way right now to get some sort of coverage. So that's one reason that also is important. And if you're not sure, you could always go to this website and uh, search your area. You could look to see if the insurance policy of your plan is, is, uh, cover, is listed here and you can actually read your own policy. That can be very helpful coming before coming to, you know, going to see your, uh, your item doctors or even coming to us because it is I, even though we're getting a lot of success in getting coverage and I think Buren would agree with me it is still a very time consuming process for staff so if you are more prepared or ahead of time you already read the policy you came with to us with your previous record we can compare for you to see if there's any amount of progression from your previous records it certainly will make this process a lot easier Next slide. Yeah, I agree. You know, it, it's definitely covered by insurance. Uh, a lot of insurance companies, and more and more, as Dr. Chang said, are providing coverage. Um, but you know, it does help to advocate for yourself. Have know your insurance policy, um, and and then you know, we have a full staff of of folks that you know, one of their main jobs is to work on the prior authorizations and talking to the insurance company and filling out the paperwork. So there are some hoops that need to that we need to to jump through. But yes, it is covered by insurance. But again, only if you're using um, an FDA approved device. Yes. And then the next question that uh, both Buren and myself get asked a lot is, OK, well, now that I'm stabled after cross-linking, when can I start wearing contact lenses again? And those are obviously more pertinent to people who couldn't see well prior to cross-linking with their glasses, or they already were wearing glass uh, contact lenses because they couldn't see well in their glasses. So those two groups of patients constantly ask this question. 
then the answer will be obviously depend on the healing period of time that is required and that is dictated by the type of cross-linking. I see that some people have were asking questions about um, you know the uh, FDA approved epithelium off type of cross-linking which my personal preference is wait for about three to four weeks. Some people can be as early as two weeks but I prefer to wait a little longer before I refit them or revalue them for their content lenses and definitely <clears throat> if uh, the epithelium on type of cross-linking uh, or trans epithelial because honestly you're not keeping 100 right now the current uh, techniques that we have doesn't really keep the entire epithelium on it's just that's an easier name to use um, they do recover quicker there's definitely that advantage and um, the trials that I have been involved in um, why they can resume contact lens fitting as early as one week or usually one to two weeks and it also depends on the type of contact lenses as I said the less pressure a lens exert on the eye the more comfortable I am of having patients go back to wearing contact lenses as long as they know how to remove the lens to not cause trauma to their eye. So your scleral lens, your hybrid lens, and even a soft keratoconus lens, you could go back a little earlier. If you want to use a gas permeable lens or you were wearing a gas permeable lens, maybe have to do a piggyback first, and that is with a soft lens on the eye before you put the uh, gas permeable lens back on. Um, so you do have to discuss that with your eye doctor, uh, whoever's managing you with your contact lenses. Um, next slide. And so this is a study that um, uh, I did when I was doing my corneal fellowship. Uh, actually, it was right after, and I, uh, Dr. Angela Shin and Dr. was the uh, fellow at the time who put a lot of work into the study, and my, our mentor, Dr. Peter Hirsch. A lot of you uh, know Dr. Peter Hirsch. And so uh, we looked at 329 eyes, and uh, they separated them by a group of patients who is willing to, um, you know, who feels they're very intolerant to contact lenses and want to get cross-linking or other surgery to help them restore tolerance to, cro to contact lenses lenses. And then the non-surgical group are the eyes that um, are, that I did not require surgery first and was uh, agreeable to let me fit them in contact lenses before deciding whether or not they need any more surgery. So if you see the circle that comes up, you'll see that even though the two group of people, obviously the lower tolerance patient prior to surgery um, at the beginning will want to go for surgery first. So psychologically that makes sense. But if you look at their contact lens success or tolerance after um, their surgery or uh, and then uh, after being refit, in a different type of contact lenses, you'll see that their success rate is almost the same and the disparity, the improvement from a 39.4% of uh, contact lens tolerance to almost 100% on the surgical group um, shows you that there's a lot of uh, benefit and that contact lens and surgery, whether cross-linking or, or otherwise, corneal transplant, intacts, you name it, um, they can be very complementary to each other in terms of getting the best visual outcome for a keratoconus patient. And let's go to the next slide here. And so, you know, then speaking on that topic, um, uh, Dr. McParra and I get asked questions a lot also on, well, what do I do now? Because can I still wear my contact lens? And our stance is that if you're not sick, you can, you know, especially for our keratoconus patients who really cannot see what, with their glasses, therefore making contact lenses a medically necessary device. So you do need to wear keratoconus patients who need their contact lenses should continue to wear their contact lenses. We do want you to obviously, if, if you haven't done this before, to make sure you observe the CDC recommendation on that 20 second or more of hand washing with soap and make sure that you follow the proper disinfection protocol that is prescribed by your eye care professional. I prefer if possible a bleach uh, containing ophthalmic solution as I believe that that can have a little bit more of a protective purposes even prior to the COVID-19, that was one of my preferred system. And then, you know, if you're sick or if you're taking care of someone who may be sick that you feel like you couldn't, you, your risk of exposure is great, um, then I do think discontinued lens wear uh, is a potential approach. Um, and, uh, and the variety of different cross-linkings, I also see questions that people were asking. And uh, yes, and again, we've explained the reason why we stayed with uh, the FDA approved cross-linking. And that's because number one, insurance. Number two, a lot of unknowns with other uh, cross-linking technique, whether it's accelerated or epion or pulsed, um, because the we don't know the effectivity. Right? The idea of removing the epithelium is to let the riboflavin soak in better. And so cross-linking has more effect. Let's go to the next slide. 
And so, you know, we do have uh, an, a clinic that's affiliated with uh, Rails Eye that actually was enrolling. It's now closed in the uh, it's in the F, the FDA trial on the FBON plus accelerated cross-linking, so it's a shorter treatment time and without removing too much of the epithelium. So we'll you know hopefully be able to share more information with you next time um, because they're still analyzing their data. Let's go to the next slide now. Pass it back yeah. to Biren. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's clear potential advantages for Epion, meaning there's no pain and, and potentially less chance of haze. But the big question is, is it as effective what we have right now? And we're and we're looking forward to to those results. So, as far as future goals go, um, you know, we're looking to hopefully improve the efficacy and make sure that the corneas remain stable long term after crosslinking. You know, we're hoping for Again, less post-op pain, more rapid visual recovery, and whether that's from epion cross-linking, time will tell. Um, we are always looking to minimize complications, and, and you know we talked quite a bit about this is a treatment for stopping progression, but we hope in the future that we may be able to provide additional treatment to not only stop progression, but also try to improve the vision or visually rehabilitate the eye with some sort of cross-linking procedure. And what we're all looking for, you know, insurance um, coverage is getting better. And what we're hoping for is fair pricing for patients, physicians, the companies, as well as the insurance companies. So everyone can benefit from this amazing technology. So kind of our take home points, um, and this is what I hope all of you um, got out of this. And this is what I hope all my patients get out of a visit to come see me is I want patients to understand what cross-linking is. It is an FDA approved procedure that's meant to strengthen the cornea, to prevent progression and to maintain vision. What's more important really is what I want, I want patients to understand what cross-linking is not. It is not a last resort, but it should be done as early as it is indicated. It's not meant to restore normal corneal shape, just stabilize it. And it does not eliminate or reduce the need for glasses or contacts, at least as of now. And then, you know, we want to be clear and we want to make sure our patients understand you know, the post-op natural course of cross-linking and the disease and the timeline that's involved. So, Jason, why don't we open it up to, to a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was really informative. A couple more coming in related to the procedure. Um, what is your what is your typical follow up look like for an individual that's undergone cross linking? How often are you seeing them uh, after the procedure? Great question. So I see them the next day just to make sure there's no signs of an obvious infection. Then about five to seven days afterwards to make sure that the corneal epithelium is healed, and I take out the bandage contact lens. And then I see them about four to six to, to maybe eight weeks afterwards to see how they're healing, to make sure there's not too much haze, to check their eye pressure because they're on steroid drops. And one of the side effects of steroid drops is high pressure. So just to make sure that hasn't gone up too much. And then I really do start to spread it out. So maybe then at about four months and then you know six months after that. And then eventually we get to the point where we see them once a year. And um, how... You know, is there kind of a established um, sense of how long this will last? Is it is it permanent? Do you see individuals who continue to progress? What's kind of the distribution uh, uh, when you do see? We are, yeah, we are hoping that this is a permanent change, um, or at least it bridges our patients up until the point where the cross where the cornea naturally crosslinks itself. So, you know, knock on wood here, um, we haven't had to retreat anyone yet at Will's Eye Hospital um, out of the hundreds that we've done. Now, in, in other studies and in FDA trials, there, there were some cases where retreatment had to be done. So it's not 100%, but that, that's also another good point is if you're still progressing despite having cross-linking, you can be cross-linked again. And then, uh, Biren, if I'm going to jump in here as well, um, so I, I will tell you, patients that it also depends on your own risk profile uh, at the time of treatment, right? So as Biren had pointed out, that we want to use cross-linking as a way of getting patients uh, to be stabilized 
uh, you know, into the age where in the age likelihood where their own age associated cross linking, that is you get more cross linking in your cornea as you as you get older, we want to wait out, you know, give you a way to get to have that kicked in with cross linking. So let's say if you have cross linking at age six, right, or eight, like uh, Buren said, at a off label type of application, the chances of you needing a second one is going to be greater. And so you're going to need to be watched closer. If you were, you know, age 40, where we think that you typically are going to get more and more your natural cross linking occurring biologically. And so, but you were progressing, so we cross linked you. So your chance of needing a second one is going to be less. Um, but there's not like an exact consensus if you, so there's, you know, can't really compute the risk level and then tell you who's going to need that second one and when. But if you look at the medical literature landscape, one of the longest uh, long-term study that I can think of is one that uh, that spans over 10 years. And they treated 40 patients and found one to progress in five years. And this is already using the F, the epithelium of cross-linking that we consider right now as being more effective and give more cross-linking reaction. And, you know, one person progressed uh, at five years and another one progressed at 10 that requires second treatment. So certainly the, the risk of needing a second one or at least the, the need of a second um, a cross-linking may, may be required. And that's why you still need ongoing eye care after cross-linking regardless of how good you see afterwards with your contact lenses or glasses. Great. We have a, a number of questions that I can I can kind of try and Speaking to that last last point uh, that was just made is it really it really does seem like having a good relationship with your eye care professional and seeking um, information and opinions is important. We have a lot of people who are really maybe thinking about an individual um, case. You know, maybe it's a post LASIK or post uh, graft, maybe after intact implantation, something as a function of age. So would you would you really think about it as um, in terms of whether one is a good candidate or whether it's a good idea? Um, it really makes a lot of sense to have a good relationship with your eye care professional. Potentially seek out several opinions. What what do you what do you what would you recommend in just kind of making a a statement on that? Um, Biren, I'll let you take uh, take that first. Sure. Yeah. Um, Jason, as you alluded to, a lot of these, especially. In, in certain circumstances or, or specific circumstances, um, it's an individual decision. You know, it, it it's really important to, and I agree 100% to to find someone. And and oftentimes you need a team approach, like what we have at Wills, is have a cornea specialist that is you know a, a surgeon and an ophthalmologist as well as an optometrist um, that that also does a lot of the medical management and helps with the contact lenses, and to have that team approach to find the right team is really, really important. And, and you know, I'd encourage, you know, anyone, if they're not comfortable with the first opinion that they got, um, to seek a second opinion. Um, just to, to one specific, you know, the, we didn't really mention much about post-LASIK ectasia at all in this talk because it is a little bit different than cross-linking, but um, at least my opinion on post-LASIK ectasia is that it's a different disease process. That's more of just the cornea not having enough strength as a result of the procedure. So anyone with post lasik ectasia, in my opinion, is progressing by definition until something is done to stop that progression. So anyone with post lasik ectasia, if they come in and see me, I just about almost always recommend cross-linking. Okay, wonderful. Well, I am. We've exhausted our question bank. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd like to thank Dr. McPara and Dr. Chang for their presentation this evening. It was very informative, um, and I would also like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Um, please be sure to join us for our July webinar presented by Dr. Gloria Chu and Annie Wynn on the topic of contact lens options. And you can check the National Keratoconus Foundation website for the most up-to-date information on that series. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, until then, on behalf of the National Keratoconus Foundation, uh, we wish you all of, all the very best and good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Stay healthy, everybody. <laughs>